at the uh, Capitan Reef. Most of you probably have not heard about it, uh, but it's uh, probably the most thick, famous fossil reef in the world. Uh, its uh, title of this talk is uh, Captain Reef Firm Science or Apprehensive Conjecture. And the uh, apprehensive is because uh, it's a matter of concern <clears throat> about what is going on here in the scientific community. What I'm talking to you about today is insight into uh, how the scientific community works and uh, concerns that that raises about the relationship of science to truth. So that, that, that's the, uh, the basic theme as we go through this this week and next week. Uh, the uh, locality of uh, the Captain Reef is in Texas or uh, in New Mexico, both places. <clears throat> Number two and four there are, are the, where the reef is located down in the lower right-hand corner. So it tells you a little bit where it is here in the countryside. I was flying an airline uh, between Texas and Boston one day and looked out the window and saw this. And what I was seeing was the uh, Capitan Reef. So you get a general idea of what this reef is. Uh, the Guadalupe Peak is uh, the highest point in Texas uh, at 8,751 feet. Uh, all Texans, please note. Uh, our Chadwick, my friend, is here. Uh, and uh, El Capitan is, is the namesake for the thing. And it's, uh, the reef itself is between those two labels there. Uh, and proceeding on to the right beyond them, that cliff there. At least that is the part that is studied uh, so much. It is supposed to be about 260 million years old. And it's supposed to have popped up out of the ground about uh, two or three million years ago. And uh, it's exposed there in a very convenient place to study it because it was underground and it popped up, uh, pushed up uh, by tectonic activity and so on. You also note a little uh, to the left of those peaks uh, behind there a little fire. For those of you who wonder if there are fires beyond California, here's an example. It, uh, this is the uh, El Capitan, and that's one of the famous localities in, in Texas. And uh, the reef gets its name from that, that peak there. The highest peak in Texas is right in the hill right behind that, if you look at this picture here. Uh, this is a little further up, looking towards the northeast from that locality along the reef and you get a picture of the reef there you see those ridges up at the top and the hillside and so on and you get this is a uh, cut through one of the many canyons that you have cutting into that hillside that exposes the many parts of that reef uh, here's a map of the uh, of the reef itself uh, <clears throat> It takes us to New Mexico a line there going right through the middle of it. <clears throat> uh, the brown part you see there toward the middle top uh, is the reef that is exposed. A lot of it's underground, uh, bluish parts. Uh, Apache Mountains are exposed, the Glass Mountains exposed. Uh, Grass Mountains are very different from the other part of the reef, but anyway, uh, it's important uh, in terms of water, uh, more important uh, commercially in terms of gas and oil. Uh, for uh, 
general picture, there is gas and oil all over this place. Okay. But uh, just right of that very reef to the right, the blue line, the extreme blue line to the right there, uh, that's where most of the oil is, a very rich area. Uh, and now uh, they're taking gas and oil out of there twice as fast as they were 10 years ago, thanks to fracking, which involves uh, injecting water into these wells along with sand and separating out the uh, sediments so that the gas and oil can flow out more rapidly. The, um, just this year, there was a major conference on the Permian Reef uh, conducted by the American Association of Petroleum Geologists. And uh, everything was about fracking. Science was not the issue. Uh, you would think maybe there'd be some interest in that. Uh, commercial concerns, of course, tend to take over in science. And uh, this is a prime example of this. There's a long history of interpretations here that we're going to be dealing with, scientific interpretations about this, uh, but they're not the primary concern in the scientific literature at present. Well, uh, Carlsbad Caverns, uh, you may uh, see the name up there, Carlsbad and Carlsbad Caverns, and they're near the top. Uh, uh, very famous, uh, have you ever been there? It's, it's a wonderful place. Uh, it has just marvelous stereothems and so on, but they're almost all dry, suggesting that there was more rapid action in the past. We'll not get into the dating of these things. At present. Uh, how did the caverns get cut? That is a disputed point. Uh, water can dissolve limestone, but it does it very slowly. Uh, probably the preferred suggestion is that uh, hydrogen sulfide gas produced sulfuric acid, and sulfuric acid can dissolve limestone quite rapidly. And so you have these big caverns, and then water drips in, and these speedofems uh, develop. Uh, incidentally, uh, hundreds of thousands of bats fly out of that cavern every evening in the summertime. So it's an incredible uh, show. It just goes on and on for about a half hour to an hour. Some of you have seen that. It, it's, uh, uh, well, getting to the question we're dealing with here. <laughs> Biblical model of a recent creation by God, so on is not accepted in general by the, by the Christian community. Adventism, of course, stands in stark contrast to that. With our Seventh-day Sabbath that uh, challenges the idea of the uh, long ages of creation. And we're here uh, today, of course, uh, based on that. But uh, secular science does not consider the possibility of God and its interpretations. Uh, theistic evolution likes to put God in there as, uh, you know, there are different, as Paul has pointed out, there are so many different uh, definitions of theistic evolution uh, that, uh, but uh, God was involved uh, in the evolution process uh, is one definition. Uh, progressive creation God repeatedly created. Uh, that is another um, uh, view. And um, these are the views, uh, the last two there, that was accepted by most of the Christian community of the world at present. And uh, so the question is, did God create years recently, as in the days in the Bible? Is the Bible reliable? These are very serious questions. If that reef is there and built, it does not permit you to have the biblical model of creation 
where the fossil record is interpreted as a result of the Genesis flood. And the, the flood is the, the important thing in, in, in all this, and uh, this diagram illustrates you what we're talking about. Your geologic columns here at the left. Uh, the middle column shows you the evolution model. And remember those figures there on the left are a million times longer than the figures on the right column. We're talking about millions of years here, we're talking about years uh, in the column on the right. And the creation model is you have creation week and so on, and most of the geologic column is the result of the flood. You put a reef in the middle of that, that would take a long time to build. There's no way that was deposited during the flood. That's the issue that we uh, are discussing and why we're considering this reef because this is a serious challenge to the Bible. Uh, did God tell us the truth when he said, I did it all in six days? Uh, God's integrity is in challenge here. Uh, well, uh, this is your geologic column. Your reef, Captain Reef, is in the blue line right there, just uh, about 260 million years old. Uh, and uh, that's right, you know, in the middle. It's not something you put up before the flood or after the flood very easily when you consider uh, you have uh, fossils throughout this whole Phanerozoic, and you've got some pre cambrian of course, fossils and so on, uh, not so well uh, seen or developed or found. Uh, but uh, this is right in the middle of that <coughs> major part of the GDI column that has the fossils in it, and that's why it's such an important thing uh, when we uh, look at this uh, Permian Reef. Well, time's the issue. Coral reefs are built slowly by organisms. Often rates of growth are estimated at a few millimeters per year or slower. Many claim that coral reefs invalidate the Bible because it would take over 100,000 years to grow uh, the largest reefs. And of course, the Permian Reef uh, is considered by uh, estimates uh, two to seven million years to grow the Permian Reef. Uh, take a lot of time. You can't do that if you're going to have your fossil record buried during the flood to explain the fossils and the fossil sequence. And we have huge living reefs and thousands of fossil reefs, many in successive order. And uh, one on top of the other. So the reef issue becomes a, a real issue. And what is a reef? Well, uh, a reef is just kind of depending on the, what you feel like. Uh, I attended a conference uh, in Denver on reefs. And um, I wanted to go there and, you know, find out what a reef was, at least what I even define a reef, you know. And uh, the second sentence of the first comment of introduction by the leader of that conference said, we are not going to consider what is and what is not a reef. Everything that is considered a reef, uh, that is labeled a reef, we're going to consider a reef. So I was greatly disappointed. I didn't walk out of the door, but I... Uh, I enjoyed the conference very much. But it's, anyway, uh, it's supposed to be water, <coughs> wave resistant, and um, we're, we're, of course, especially interested in biological reefs. Some, some structures are called reefs that are not of biological origin, but uh, they call them ecologic reefs, they call them bioherms. Uh, they built by organisms, uh, especially uh, that's where the time comes in. 
a lot of interpretations of reason as inorganic and so on, or inorganic activity can be done after or before the flood. But the, the biological factors, those are slow, and those take time. And that, that's where the that's where the uh, issue of time comes in very seriously. Uh, kind of organisms that build them, uh, coral, coral and algae, uh, bryozoans, uh, at least sometimes suggested, uh, mollusks, uh, one or two rare ones in Texas, uh, Udis reefs, uh, very curious organisms uh, that build these. Uh, sponges, we'll get into that next week. Uh, uh, that, that's a very interesting thing. Uh, uh, as a biological fact in the reef associated with the Capitan Reef. Well, uh, briefly, what is a reef? This is a typical classical uh, diagram of a reef. And note especially, first on the left, the back reef. That's the back part of the reef. Uh, all the grayish, or I should say gray, tan, light tan material there below the blue. Uh, that, that's uh, parts of a reef. Uh, you have a lagoon, you have a patch reef, if you're going to the left and right there. You have a reef core. That is the business part of the reef. That's the part that produces the sediments. That's where the biological activity is. And uh, organisms like coral uh, and algae, those are the top producers of reef material. And uh, from that higher point, uh, you have the four reef going down the, and so on, open ocean, and then you have basins beyond that. Uh, so keep this in mind. I. I, I know some of you aren't familiar with reefs, and some of you are very familiar, but uh, I'm trying to stick to a fairly simple concepts to start out with, anyway. Uh, keep going the back reef, keep the reef core in mind, that's the business part of the reef. Uh, the four reef, that's stuff produced by the four reef, and the Beyond that, we have a, a further basin out there. This is a picture of the Captain Reef. Uh, as you look at it, and here are the three basic parts that I've been telling you about. <clears throat> and back there, those horizontal layers you see across the top, those are the uh, back reef, the reef core. You can see the massive reef core. That is the part that produces the reef. And then you've got the fore reef below. And that reef core extends to the left in various places, exposed in various places, and it is supposed to have produced all these fore reef layers. Yes, Paul? In this particular picture, um, I am gathering that uh, the reef core in front of where it's labeled back roof reef has been eroded away? Uh, it's below. There are some little exposures below it. It's below. It's below the back reef. Does that bother you? Uh, not if you consider a gradual building of this reef. In other words, uh, these, this four reef that we have here was built when the reef core was further to the left here in this picture and produced these four reef layers here. So uh, that's the way you reconcile uh, the picture you have here of uh, uh, this reef core quite a ways back. Not those back reef layers. That's a tensile the eights formation. Uh, not those. It, we'll get into that uh, just a little minute or two. Here's a, a living reef just to uh, balance the picture up a little bit. 
<coughs> that is, I know we talk at all. A blue, dark blue area there, that's the open ocean. Uh, that'd be the four reef area. The whitish line, that's the reef. That's where the wave resistant structures are. Uh, a lot of algae and uh, corals there and so on. And the uh, rest of the picture to the left here, lower left the corn and so on. That's the lagoon. Uh, that's the uh, the fore reef, uh, sorry, the, uh, the back reef. Uh, here's a picture of the same reef at low tide. Uh, you know, it's a lagoon right here that is an artificial one, created by an atomic bomb. Uh, I've been diving into that one, and there's another one up there uh, just above it, too. They set off two, you know, after we had created atomic bomb, we had to uh, test it out. They did it, and we talked at all. And they wanted to test two of them at the same time. And they got two craters, uh, whatever that meant, I'm not sure, uh, in terms of uh, what they discovered, but uh, interesting features. But, Lots of limestone there. Uh, What's the name of this place? Anawitok Atoll. Huh? Anawitok Atoll. Spelled several different ways. Uh, and it's in the Western Pacific. And uh, you've heard of Bikini? That was another place where we did some tests. But we did a lot of tests here. And then we talk at all, and this is some of the material left there. And of course, I, I was studying coral reefs with my graduate students and so on, and we go where there's reefs. And so the, the uh, University of Hawaii ran a laboratory for research there, and we used that facility for our research. Um, Built by organisms here, and a wonderful world. I mean, it's underwater world. It's, many of you've seen it. I mean, yeah, I just never cease to marvel. At, look at the underwater water world. But these shells that you see there, these are the coral that build the reefs uh, and so on. And uh, that eventually uh, rather huge structures. The, the largest structures on the surface of the earth built by organisms are reefs. And uh, some of them, you know, like the Great Barrier Reef are quite significant, not very deep. Great Barrier Reef is a very shallow reef uh, compared to the others. But we're interested in fossil reefs here. Right now I must point out to, to you that uh, there's a major, seems a major difference between fossil reefs and present reefs. And this is not a quote you'd expect. It's not according to uh, what we normally try to do in comparing old reefs and new reefs, but I must point this out to you. Normally, uh, living reefs are larger, very large structures, sit on top of volcanic uh, layers and so on, uh, up to the surface of the ocean, like I know we talk about all the time. Fossil reefs, we find them in the fossil record, in the layers. They are usually small. There are over 2,600 fossil reefs that have been listed in the scientific literature. Uh, some of them are only 5 centimeters high and 20 centimeters wide. Not to be taken too seriously in terms of time. Uh, could be a depositional mound and so on. But uh, and there seems to be a major difference, and we're going to uh, emphasize this, uh, especially next week, uh, between uh, living reefs and fossil reefs. But a couple, couple comments from the literature about this. Uh, <coughs> the uh, this one says various fossil structures. What is Oxford? Uh, let's see. 
Oxford Blackwell book and so on. The various fossil structures have come to be called reefs simply because their features seem to include framework or relief in the absence of clear evidence to the contrary. In other words, you, you find a bump or something that looks like it's resistant or something, then you call it a reef. And uh, here's another by Middleton and Murray. Uh, these guys are the top sedimentologists of the world. I mean, uh, closer inspection of many of these ancient carbonate reefs reveal that they are composed largely of carbonate mud with the larger skeletal particles floating. Very important term. Uh, within the mud matrix. In other words, they're not tiled together, not growing on each other, type thing. Conclusive evidence for a rigid organic framework does not exist in most of the ancient carbonate mounds. In this sense, they are remarkably different from modern coral algal reefs. And as you'll see next week, uh, this and uh, the Captain Reef fits right into this particular comment here. It is not like your modern reefs. Nevertheless, uh, 2,600 of these fossil reefs are structures are considered reefs, and uh, sometimes you're not allowed to ask whether or not they are reefs. Uh, this tells you a little bit the, the picture. The little white spots, you see, dots you see, roundish dots and so on, uh, those are horn coral, uh, and you see them floating in this matrix this mud matrix, as uh, that uh, last uh, quotation mentioned. Capitan Reef, uh, we get to a great deal of discussion about it. And it, it, this is part of, the, uh, part of the message I want to leave with you today. And that is that uh, this is a, a book re review of the reference at the bottom here, which uh, is a classic on the Captain Reef. And uh, the major controversy of the Captain Reef occurred right at the turn of this century. And uh, this is, uh, c contains a lot of that uh, data, that review and so on. But this person reviewing it, he just says, the magnificent Captain. El Capitan, is as controversial as it's classical. There are many important disputations about this reef, at least four basic models about how the reef is assumed to have grown have been proposed. We're going to get into that a little bit today, uh, more so next week. Uh, in that introduction, in the introduction to that, to that uh, compendium, uh, papers, uh, Controversies they mention are one. Uh, these are almost all taken right out of the outline. He lists each one of these as separate in his introduction. Origin of the Capitan Reef. We'll discuss that next week. That's the business part that's supposed to have produced all this stuff. The depth of the reef dip of the fallen beds. We'll get to that very quickly. Uh, where was the sea level? Origin of pisolites. Uh, those are special structures supposed to be produced by algal growth. Uh, origin of TPs. We'll get that to today's point. Also, the deposition of basin silicoplastics. Uh, confusing a lot of sand in this reef. Uh, sequence stratigraphy relationships. You have to get into that if you're a geologist nowadays. And origin of caves, we already discussed that. We're going to add to his list also the Egyptian dolomite contacts of the back reef, the deposition of the Forex talus and the reef ecology. Uh, discuss some of today and tomorrow and the next week. The back reef. Uh, Back reef is that, remember that reef, it's on the back side of, of the uh, reef core. And uh, the, when you look at the Capitan Reef, the strange thing is that the back reef seems to be higher than the reef. 
Now, keep in mind, you can't, this is, this is the way it looks, this is the way it's discussed. I, uh, I can remember, I was at a conference uh, about the Captain, about the Captain Reef, and uh, Lloyd Prey, uh, University of Wisconsin, held up his hand, he's out there in the field tile talking to us, you know. He said, look at that line of those layers up there. He says, they're all going down. He said, this reef was never above water. It was all underwater. That's one of the points they discussed. He reemphasized that point because in the evening, he comes into the lecture room with a, a mask, a scuba mask on, I mean, a, just a diving mask on. And he starts talking about through that mask. He said, I just want to emphasize to you folks that the thing was never above water. It's always underwater. And he was talking underwater. Uh, anyway, uh, these are issues that, that point out the controversy that, that exists here. Uh, well, the fallen beds, they call them fallen beds because uh, they tend to fall down as you get closer to the reef core. Here, uh, these would be the uh, three main parts up there. We're talking about that back reef, those layers up on top there. And uh, note this diagram here of a, a cross section of the Capitan Reef. These are the various formations, and uh, in the top left there, you know, the Tansel Formation, Yates Formation, Seven Rivers Formation. Those are the fallen beds, those are the back reef, okay? You see the Capitan Reef itself, that's the reef core, that's the business part, that's the part that's supposed to have produced all, all the biological stuff that you have in the back reef, or I should say all of it, most of it. Uh, then you got the Captain Reef, Four Reef Talus. Note that uh, that's supposed to have been produced by the reef itself. Then you got Bell Canyon, Cherry Canyon, Brescia Canyon, so on. Uh, that's the basin stuff. There's an awful lot of sand in it. So you, they call these the fallen beds, and I'm still in the fallen down to you know, the Tansel Yates, et cetera, whatever. Because of the, you know they looks like they fell down in towards the reef, uh, but they are supposed to have been produced by the reef, and of course uh, <coughs> the idea that uh, well if I can get the uh, marker the idea is that oh boy trying. See this? This is the reef. This reef produced these these uh, beds here, or at least contributed in a major part to them. And so, uh, while it looks like they're above, and they slant down this way, about 10 degrees throughout the whole uh, region, uh, five, 10, more, 15 degrees. Uh, it's they slant down. Uh, this would have produced material here and so on, this reef. As long as it was higher, it could still produce material here. That is the uh, accepted uh, plan. So you, you get, you can't, just because you have that slanting thing, you can't say, well, no, they, they're too high. Nevertheless, uh, many feel, hey, this thing was always underwater. And it's not a question of what's too high or too low. To go further into this, here is uh, another picture from a uh, greater distance of that uh, Captain Reef. And note those layers up on top there. 
Now you see these layers? This is all Yates formation. This is the reef itself. Uh, here's some reef here. This is some of the reef itself and so on. Uh, below it, this is a tensile, uh, sorry, this is all Yates formation also. Uh, this is tensile formation here and so on. And those are supposed to be the back reef. And of course, uh, some scientists feel somewhat uncomfortable with that and they say, well, it, it wasn't a question of this. It, these formed underwater. It was not a question of reef feeding them and so on. Uh, that's part of the issue that you have here as you contend with this uh, Capitan Reef. And so, but you could argue on the side of uh, those who favor it being that, well, maybe when it uplifted, it, it uplifted, didn't it uplift evenly? Uh, well, that, uh, because it's, it slants down about 10 degrees. Uh, those top layers there, you, you can see them very, very well there. Uh, you know, it's, uh, they slant down and so on, uh, in the wrong direction. This stuff's supposed to come from the core. Into, into the lagoon and uh, the uh, the back reef and so on. Well, where was the sea level? Uh, there have been all kinds of arguments about it. Well, was it underwater? Was it above water? And so on. Four basic models uh, that we have for where the sea was, where the reef was, and so on, are listed here. There is King's classic study. He did not emphasize very much uh, the sea level and so on. He did emphasize, and this is model A here in the left-hand upper living corner. He did emphasize that, uh, well, it was more like a continuous slope there. This is more or less what you see nowadays. Uh, back reef, higher layers, higher up, and so on. Uh, reef uh, in the middle and then in the four reef uh, below, and sea level above that. And in 1953, a very famous book came out uh, by Norman Newell. I uh, have a soft spot in my heart for Norman Newell. He once wrote and said, Origins, which I was, I was a journal, I was editing. So it is the most scientific creation journal there is. And so, uh, but uh, I can't agree with him. I agree with him on that one. I don't agree with him on this one. Uh, he, uh, he said, no, he says he's going to make a reef out of this. So, well, make the reef part higher. Of course, it's not there now, you know. Uh, that part's been uh, eroded away, but you get a picture that the barrier reef was there at the sea level uh, and so on, and you, you had a reef growing and the reef producing the back reef and, and the fore reef and uh, uh, other sediments contributing uh, to what you have there. Uh, and that study... Uh, was well, accepted for a while, but uh, was soon criticized. Uh, later on, uh, Dunham, 1972. Very interesting introduction uh, uh, to this controversy in that Dunham, uh, probably the first and only that I know of, a scientist who said, hey, this is not biological. This is uh, sediments. Uh, laid down and uh, I'll tell you the pile of sediments in that reef structure sediments laid down and, and so on and, uh, but then you found these pisolites and you can see pisolites listed here uh, right here you found these he said those had to be above sea level but the rest was this way um, and this is, a, this is a pile of sediments, the reef. Uh, not, not a biological structure. Well, uh, discussion went on 
Uh, here's the fourth model that, that we have now. There are all kinds of models out there. Uh, what did I see, about 5,000 different papers or, or uh, citations of papers on the Permian Reef. It's, uh, there's a lot of literature out there. But the model D, you have this pisolite above sea level here, but uh, Kirkland, uh, Brenda Kirkland, uh, found some algae here, some mysia algae, and she interpreted the mysia algae having to live in a lagoon, a quiet area, couldn't have resisted all those waves. And so she said that it had, it had to be a, a, a quiet water there, and so she put a peak out here uh, at the end, a peak right here, and, uh, and so on. And also kept uh, Dunham's uh, pisolite shelf and uh, a lagoon back here type. So that's this is the 1992 uh, model, and that's. Right now, generally, people say, well, we have different models. Uh, but uh, I think this one tends to probably be favored a little bit. Uh, I've been notified that people want references from what we say. And so for those who are on the Internet or want to look at it, these are the references for those, different four, those four different models. There, We'll not bother you with them. Pisel lists. Uh, what are they? <clears throat> Here's a picture of Python Live. Uh, these are those little round circles there, about a centimeter in diameter. And they have, you see, concentric layers within them. The uh, question is, you know, how are they produced? Well, they're supposed to be produced by algae and uh, so on, and that would take time. And then, on the other hand, sometimes the layers go around two different ones, so you know, hey, that's not algae. Uh, this is after they were deposited and so on. So there's been a considerable controversy about that. I have an example right here, uh, Roxanne, if you want to see it afterwards, of, of these pisolists. Uh, and uh, just briefly, what goes on in terms of interpretations. One, <clears throat> Algae growing in the surface of fine grains. That's uh, following the general history of interpretations here for those pisolists. Then arguments, no algal cells could be found. You know, you say algae, but hey, where are the cells? Well, cells don't always preserve. Like they don't preserve. So others, algae did produce them. Yeah, you know, there's no question. Uh, we have little round things produced by algae, no question. Uh, some of our de uh, sedimentary deposits produce uh, fine, usually not as big as, as these pisolips. Uh Dunham, that we mentioned too earlier and so on, said no, these were produced inorganically. And the Vedo zone, that's the zone above the water table but below the surface of the ground. So, they, so it's producing that video as well. And then some polygon filling layers around several pisoids. The interview once can be called pisoids. Terminology varies. Uh, that's why they call them. <clears throat> but uh, you have uh, several layers going around them. Obviously, you produce layers without the algae. And so they were saying inorganic. Well, uh, some put algae and, and organic in prison together. You know, oh, parts algae, parts are inorganic, and so on. And uh, a more recent, later interpretation, probably inorganic below the water sediment line, which would be below the veil zone. Well, for references, uh, see an article I wrote on this a long time ago. Uh, TP structures, very interesting structures here. You, you see this throughout, especially the back reef uh, sediments. Uh, things that go up, where the layers go up. Now, right in the middle of this picture, you 
see a line kind of go up and down. See layers going up towards that thing. These are 12 TP structures. Uh, this uh, picture here is probably about a meter in height. But you get those layers. A lot of, hey, hey, what about, oh, how did this fo those form? Well, uh, here's a uh, listing of different interpretations uh, by Saller and Al. That's that reference that I gave you in the uh, uh, announcement about this. Uh, they form by compression during the deposition. In other words, uh, there was pressure to push them together during deposition because layers lay to the side and so they pushed up. Uh, that would fit nicely for flood model for us. Uh, crystallization of evaporite minerals. Uh, that's the idea that uh, anhydrite, which is calcium sulfate, when you add water to it, expands the calcium uh, uh, to gypsum. Uh, and so it, it has more volume and that squeezes the things up. Uh, desiccation cracks, things dried out. Uh, and uh, so the, there was a crack there and when it came back together probably you had a little push. Thermal expansion and contraction, that's due to temperature changes. Upward moving groundwater, uh, interesting. That, that one fit nicely if they uh, flood in the ways because you'd have all this groundwater escaping out during the flood as the sediments dewatered. Uh, discharging groundwater, uh, kind of the same uh, idea as uh, uh, the previous one, uh, except it, it's the exit of those that may be more significant. Silicolastic system within core from low stands of the sea. This is sea level change, and this caused upsets in the sediments, and that caused those TP structures. But yeah. so. A lot of different ideas here uh, as you deal with the Permian Reef. Gypsum dolomite contact of the back reef. Uh, very interesting feature we see. This is the, uh, you go in the back reef and you look at some of those layers back there, been eroded, or some have been eroded away. And the most striking feature you see here is that whitish layer. That is gypsum. The layers to the right of that whitish layer, the horizontal layers to the right, are dolomite. Dolomite is supposed to be formed by some calcium carbonate and uh, some kind of magnesium added to it and so on. The left one is formed by evaporation. Uh, you can get dolomite by evaporation also, but it takes a different concentration. So the question then, how come you have such a sharp difference between the, the gypsum and the dolomite? Dolomite produced, and uh, they'd say organisms, the reef core would have produced organisms and uh, parts of, you know, of... Uh, calcified organisms and so on, the mixture there, versus the uh, pure gypsum uh, to the left. And this is part of the uh, uh, contention here uh, in connection with this. And then this thing's been discussed uh, quite a bit. Uh, just to uh, <clears throat> acquaint you a little bit with the, what the chemistry is here, uh, if you take a thousand feet of seawater and you start evaporating them. When you get down to 533 feet to 190 feet, you're going to produce carbonate, limestone. I'm talking about calcium carbonate. I'm talking about dolomite, calcium magnesium carbonate. And you're going to recover five... Uh, hundreds of a foot of that. You go from 190 feet to 30 feet. In other words, your column is better than both. 
evaporated down to just 30 uh, feet, you get a gypsum and uh, anhydrite, which is a gypsum without water, and you're going to get uh, four tenths of a foot. And then uh, finally you can get salt out of it, and you get a lot of salt out of seawater. And this is by weight, it has nothing to do with 3.5%, they say, the facilitated water, which is a <coughs> uh, They go by, uh, I'm sorry, this is by volume, they go by weight for the 3.5%. So keep in mind, this is the volume uh, which we are interested in. So you got this. You have to, for these evaporites, like these big layers of gypsum that we mentioned in the previous, you're going to have to, well, some of those layers of gypsum in that previous slide, uh, they're, they're seven meters thick. You're going to have to evaporate 11 miles of water to get that much gypsum. So, the... Geologists are fully aware of this. Fully aware of this. What do they uh, do? Well, they, they reflux it. I'll explain that in the next slide. Uh, quartz, silicon dioxide, that's important, but it, I want you to just know it's entirely different from these other molecules we've been talking about. So here, how, how, do, you, how do you produce uh, enough gypsum, for instance, like, uh, and this is a diagram of that earlier picture there, your dolomite to the right, your dolomitic limestone layers to the left there, and that rather sharp change there between the two. Well, uh, one model is to reflux the, uh, the seawater. In other words, uh, lower concentration here, higher concentration here, and uh, you keep, the water gets more concentrated as it goes further back in, in the back reef, and you, and you get more gypsum out, and so you have the gypsum here and you have dolomite there, uh, where it was less concentrated. The question is, of course, why would you have such a sharp line in a, a pool of, of the lagoon. Uh, but uh, that is the reflux model it is definitely considered. Another model is a Sabka model, and that's where uh, gypsum concentrates by capillary action above sea level. Uh, the example for that is in the Persian Gulf, called the Sabkas. And there you have seawater rising up and uh, by capillary action and being and gypsum being concentrated. A lot of other things are concentrated there too. It doesn't give an answer to our pure dolom, uh, gypsum layers that we find. But uh, these are the two suggestions as to how you can do this because you can't do it by straight evaporation. There's not that much stuff uh, there in seawater. Uh, but uh, Bates, who early studied this area, he found some funny things here. For instance, uh, yeah, layers, but note the whitish layer. That's gypsum. You're not going to get those layers laid down like that so nicely uh, by just ordinary evaporation. This obviously transported in there. And uh, he uh, expanded it and thought, well, maybe uh, it got water in it later, so the anhydride changed to gypsum and uh, got a little thicker, and his layer is a little bit thicker. I, I spent a half a day looking and trying to find this place uh, out there in, in the back reef. Uh, I th this is 40 years later. Who knows what have happened to all the sediments after that, before that, down the hillside. Uh, I called up uh, Fred Sarge. He had just published a paper on this stuff. And uh, uh, he uh, 
he said, well, I, I, I look for Bates' contacts. He says, I, or his layers and so on. He says, I, I think I found something that looked like it, but I'm not sure. Well, I, I, I thought I saw something like it, but I'm not sure either. So uh, we haven't found this locality, but uh, certainly he has a couple of pictures that show it, and there's a copy of, uh, from those pictures that uh, it looks transported uh, for all that, you know, not evaporation. Uh, the rest of it would be, of course, a much lower concentration. You have your con higher concentration where you have uh, a whitish layer. Well, uh, interpretations of that, of the back reef. Uh, part one, uh, Bates, his idea was, accepts that form in shallow sea, yeah, back reef, that was it. Abrupt interfingering, so he found several cases of abrupt interfingering which uh, doesn't look sound like evaporation, or say sounds like layers moving in between each other. Uh, Kendall, his overall view with shallow water carbonates, eolian, that means wind, wind cord silts, supertidal evaporates, that's your Sabka model. Uh, that was his suggestion for it. We move on here. Uh, Sarge, <clears throat> he thought everything was well, no, it was just went all underwater. And just changing water conditions. He just changed the concentration. I don't know how you're going to keep a concentration on the sharp line over millions of years uh, to keep your dolomite on one side and you keep your gypsum on the other. Uh, Brown, uh, more recent uh, suggestion, which had been made before, incidentally. <clears throat> Meteorite dissolution. He said, well, the reason you don't have the gypsum closer to the reef core is that it was dissolved out. Uh, others argue, well, if it's dissolved out, you should have more of a pattern not a sharp line, uh, which extends for miles at that sharp line. Uh, so you, you have a variety of different ideas there regarding this. And uh, this is a back reef. I just want you to follow that arrow there. You follow that layer all the way across, it goes up and down. <clears throat> it's a mega ripple mark, huge ripple mark. Uh, and the layers there, you can tell by the plants uh, how it's pretty big. And uh, you do have some evidence of rapid activity. It doesn't mean everything else and in the back reef had to be that way, but it does tell you uh, that something was going on there that's not normal deposition according to the long slope rate. Okay. Well, uh, for reef in the basin, it. <clears throat> We'll uh, discuss this uh, briefly here. <clears throat> Basinal siliciclastics. Reef building organisms produce limestone. That's your reef core. But there is lots of sandstone, especially in the basin deposit. So the sandstone is assumed to have come from the back reef or beyond. Many suggest that when the sea level was high, limestone was produced for the fore reef, while at low sea level, sandstone was carried across the reef. You've got to account for all this sand that you find in the fore, in the, uh, fore reef. And so they say, well, the sea level was low and sand flew over the, over the reef uh, and so on. You'd expect it might be trapped in channels and so on and that uh, you don't find much of it there in the reef at all. It's carbonate. The reef is solid, almost solid carbonate. Uh, 
So there's that, that question about that uh, feature. The uh, issue is, is this. Uh, just to review you. <clears throat> Here, here's the uh, cancel formation. So on these, these have some sand in them. They, they, uh, here's your reef. That's pure lime. Uh, four reef has some sand in it. But the question is, how did all this stuff here in the basin? How did I get all the sand across that reef? And so there were very, there were very few channels. And so this remains as a as, as a question uh, about that uh, peculiar feature and issue that is another issue that is uh, discussed, but generally thought, well, it came in when the sea was low and the sand was above, blew in over, over the reef, and we got it all down there. So, uh, <clears throat> just uh, in, in finishing, I want to go through into the uh, four reef itself. <clears throat> which uh, some evidence of four reef deposition. Uh, when you look at the four reef, you know the strong bedding pattern. And, uh, down slope layers. This is not what you would expect from slow gradual accumulation of sediments produced by reef core over millions of years. The reef produces l little bits of sediment and so on. How are you going to get these huge beds? that we have in the four reef. We'll show you a picture of them again. Uh, the extended bed should have rapid lateral downslope transport. They find turbidites. Uh, you may not be familiar with turbidites. They are very rapid deposits, 55 miles per hour. Uh, they had turbidites in that four reef. You're not gonna get turbidites unless you have fine sediments where are you going to store your fine sediments on the reef to produce the turbines when you got all these waves and so on? But they're there. Evidence of rapid action there. Bedding pattern, not expected. Uh, <clears throat> here's the, uh, what we're talking about here, the four reef, the right of this. See all these beds here? Beds are some of them are debris flows, that's mud flowing, flowing mud with uh, mixed in uh, class inside. Uh, turbidites they flow rapidly. And such pronounced bedding, it doesn't look like this came from that uh, reef core up there in that uh, it's so abundant for one thing, and it's so well bedded uh, for another. And but uh, it's incorporated well. It happened. Uh, third point: there are breaches in the four reef deposits in Macritic and Slaughter Canyons. These sharp angular breaches particles are more what they expected from catastrophic deposits than from rock class surrounded by wave activity around the reef. However, not all the four reefs is brexited, keep that in mind. You don't want to overstate the case. Uh, and finally, a few mega brexes are obvious in the basin deposits. That's just a little further beyond the uh, four reef. And we'll show you some pictures of those. This is the brexiated material in the uh, uh, four reef. And you can have a coin there for size on the left. Uh, sharp stuff. Hasn't been transported very far, obviously. Be rounded. Uh, here are some of the mega breccias, big, big plant. This is in the basin area. Those gray areas and around all, all this tiny stuff is sandstone, folks. A tremendous amount of sand there. You had to push over that reef. Uh, but you see those uh, 
three masses all the way through that cliff right there. Uh, great big hawks. Uh, those are those have to be transported catastrophically. Here's a picture of some right there. Two of them at the top there, uh, on top of that sandstone. And uh, what was the scale there? Would they be larger than the bottom of the Um. No, it uh, probably an automobile would be across the there across. Uh, there, there. There's some trees up there. There's three. There are three, three or four feet in diameter, and so on. Uh, there, uh, there, uh, here's one right here, again showing you sediment that suggests probably some deep water and. The stuff was soft because the layers tend to bend down a little bit when they rolled in. It was probably all part of a massive uh, flow, and when it dewatered, uh, the layers bent. Uh, and uh, just for references, in case I did those, I uh, don't figure out what I've been talking about there. But then finally, one person came out, hey, finally, they're going to raise a question about that four reef. You know, I've, I've been looking at that thing for years. And nobody said, oh, no, no, it just came off from the reef. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, in, in 214, uh, Colin Braithwaite, University of Glasgow. <clears throat> he said, hey, you folks calling this talus, uh, stuff. It's not talus. Uh, so that's a misnomer. It doesn't form that way. His model is that the reef is there. He's talking in terms of long ages here. Here's the reef. Uh, it gets exposed and uh, because the sea level drops. Uh, breaks down and uh, a lot of our fossil rates don't break down that easily but anyway uh, that's his mouth it breaks down and then what you that's what produces this forage stuff because it's it's rubble it's coarse and so on uh, and, and what you people are calling a talus is that's supposed to come from the reef growth uh, is not there because most of the fine material that is produced by the reef is carried by waves over the reef into the lagoon. That's his argument, anyway. Uh, I'm interested in that simply, not because of his particular model, per se, but at least he's challenging this four reef interpretation. And, you know, he talks about here reef fonts and so on, and comparing debris derived by contemporaneous erosion of the reef. However, evidence from wave transport indicates that on the present day reefs, the bulk of the debris generated in this way accumulates in the back reef area. During slow sea stands, the margin of the platforms commonly becomes unstable and so on, uh, with instability reflecting the slope failure and the shedding of blocks ranging from meters to kilometers in diameter associated with generation of the debris flows and turbidites. Reef talus is a misleading description of debris predominantly generated by platform erosion and slope failure. And I, I think uh, at least he's uh, saying, hey, uh, this was produced catastrophically. Uh, I doubt that all those layers of the four reef of the Capitan Reef could have come from that Reef besides that they're quite different in many respects. So here are those layers. He's saying no, that's not talus. That's the result of catastrophic activity of the reef breaking down. If you have enough reef to break down. Conclusions? Uh, We'll go over those uh, next week.
again, but uh, I'll say I'll just simply say this: uh, what what does this tell us? At least at this point, we will get into much more specific stuff next week, uh, for more personal uh, activity and so on. Uh, but we've got all these different ideas. Uh, it does tell you that uh, there doesn't seem to be a fixed data of solid, I mean, fixed reference of solid data that they use to say that it's a reef. And uh, the, the, the serious conclusion is the last point down here at the bottom presence of so many unsupported interpretations and total exclusion of the Bedouin model indicates a secular bias of almost anything goes except the Bedouin model. Yeah. All kinds of ideas out there. Don't you touch the Bible. Uh, this tells you there's a secular bias there and we need to keep uh, that in mind and just as a uh, a final reminder, uh, our contribution can be let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. There's plenty of data to support uh, the Bible uh, model, and we'll see much more of that next week. So, any questions? <coughs> Wondering if uh, in the valley, uh, in the basin, those layers that are there, if they might actually continue under the reef, or are they only present in the basin? Uh, they're only present in the basin. Under the reef, we've got other layers like the San Andres Formation and so on that are not the same layers that are in the basin. But they are <laughs> under these layers that are in the basin. Is there some layer that is continuous under all of this? You go down far enough, yes. Uh, How far do you have to go? Well, you'd have to account for the uplift, you understand. Well, I, I mentioned San Andres uh -huh. formation. Uh, it's more widespread, much more widespread there in New Mexico. And uh, it's, I think it's uh, fairly well, well, into central New Mexico and so on. Uh, there is a layer below you know, that continues. So these are, these are new layers. with uh, geomorphology and you're looking at today's geomorphology not the geomorphology of the past it's, it's going to be a big difference but what we see today looks like we have a ring almost entire circle of what's called reef deposits now, if you go south, I looked up on a map this morning. If you go south of Capitan, you come to the Apache Mountains. They are said to have reef deposits. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they have the whole works. I think it's best exposed there at Capitan, if I'm yeah, correct right. on that. If you go to the east, though, uh, you don't have the mountains popping up, and you have what are said to be buried portions of the same reef complex. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about the rest. And so if you look at the paleogeographical map, it's almost horseshoe shaped with an opening to the south. Am mm -hmm. I getting that correct? Right. So how, how do we explain that? Either on a long term old age model or a short term, how do we get horseshoes, giant horseshoes in the uh, fossil record? Well, I'm curious. Uh, mm. No, you know. <laughs> we uh, we tend to think of atolls, for instance, or reefs. You know, they're, they're big. They're big. Uh, oh, 
And we talk runs 20 miles in diameter. Okay. This, this one is... runs about 70 miles in diameter. Yeah. But At least three this, times as wide. This is just the opposite of and we talk. In what way? The ocean is in the middle. Oh, yeah, yeah. And this is a reef on the edge of that ocean. True. And uh, the uh, opening of the ocean was in the south. In, in the, the south. Southwest. Right. Of that big circle there that, yeah. we, uh, that we showed you in the map. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, this is not an atoll at all. It's not interesting. Uh, it has a general shape of an atoll. It's bigger than probably, well, no, we, the compound atolls in the Indian Ocean are huge. Uh, but it's, uh, land beyond, considered terrestrial beyond, uh, in part. But it's, you know, it's a big ocean there. And then uh, later on, that ocean evaporated, and you have the Castile Formation, which uh, That's another is, issue. is a whole other topic, a fascinating topic uh, to consider. So, uh, but keep that in mind. No, they, when they look at this, uh, this is a, an ocean surrounded by a reef. So putting it within a flood model, it seems like the basin would be formed after the uplift or all the debris accumulating around the horseshoe. And then the last deposits are in the middle, mm -hmm. right, time-wise. Could they be post-flood, or do we try and speculate on that? Well, and you've got the, um, the Castile is gypsum, you know. Yeah, it's gypsum and some anhydrite, well, and some other. There, yeah, there's yeah. a whole sequence of oh, evaporative yeah. minerals, they say. Was it 400,000 uh, layers? Yeah, yeah they, they're uh, well-defined layers. <laughs> and some very interesting stuff that challenges that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's another topic. So... Uh, no, I, I would think, you know, you had to have a source of gypsum somewhere here. And yeah. uh, the, uh, that sum was transported, Bates's paper, you know, obviously transported, obviously transported. Uh, other stuff, four reef, uh, that's got to be transported. That's not North Reef deposit at all. All the bedding there. Uh, the uh, so on. The, all I can. Th you've got to think in terms of different sources. It's the only way you can fit it into the flood model. Different sources. Certainly that, that reef. It's fine carbonate sand. I mean it is. Very fine, mm -hmm. uh, the whole thing. Uh, hardly a bedding. I mean, it's massive. I can't. It stretches my imagination to think how that thing ever got deposited uh, in a massive catastrophic way. I but think if I it was if it was slow, with no bedding, and uh, boy, next week you see all kinds of arguments uh, about how that thing got, well, it became a reef. I think I can speak for all of us as an extremely complex picture that boggles the mind. But what, what whatever that? model you have, whatever right. model. Right, right. But you won't, they allow all kinds of models, but they won't allow the Bible. Yeah. I, I think, I think, yeah. I'm curious how you would... Um, address the part where he was they were talking about the uh, gypsum on the one side and anhydrate and then the dolomite under a basically a flood model at a very rapid evaporation or deposition mm -hmm. or, or sedimentation out of that the only thing I can suggest is different sources and 
two sources came together at the same time there and it produced a sharp line. You know, uh, they have lots of time, okay? They can evaporate their stuff lots of time uh, to evaporate their stuff. We've got lots of catastrophism. I, we need to be careful that we uh, distinguish between fact and interpretation. And I, that's speculation, and I tell you that speculation, but it's something to look at. Yeah, I'm trying to get my brain around this thing. Um, it, there obviously are several what you might nearly call competing uh, models, but which is the dominant one? Did the reef rise or was the surroundings washed away, whether by water or by you know, oh. winds and earthquakes and so on? But what, what's really happened and, and formed this thing? That, no. I can't quite get that. Okay. okay. <clears throat> According to their standard model, the reef developed 260 million years ago. Okay? It was a reef there, hidden in the ground. Uh -huh. Okay. Pliocene, Pleistocene, uh, two or three million years ago, uh, it was pushed up. So what you're seeing here reflects a little bit the reef picture because it just happened to push up and hey, hey, we got a ridge. There's a ridge. It's just the way it happened to be pushed up. Uh, so don't confuse the present cliff with the original cliff. Although it's it's not far off. And this is what makes this thing interesting, you know, is because people see, people see a reef there. They, they see a reef there. And, uh, well, here's the core, and here's the palace, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, it happens to have risen up in a form that makes it look like a reef, uh, which didn't have. Well, it had about, it's about the same proportions. Remember those diagrams I had were five times, exaggeration was five times. They're much wider than those diagrams I showed you. Uh, the, the actual thing is quite, quite widespread. Studied and argued about uh, over and over. Um, oh, the, right. the, the Permian Reef is the, the, the uh, Permian Basin is probably the, the best studied seismic study place in the world. But almost every well that's drilled out there, and if you fly over it, it's a, it's a complete patchwork of oil wells. They're, they're making money. I think probably almost every well is drilled into a coral reef. And so if you want a pattern of coral reefs to look like an atoll, which is a fundamental model, you can make it easily, even if there's not one there. Because <laughs> you have reefs everywhere. And I, I know for a fact, because I have some friends that are drilling, and I have some friends that are selling <laughs> leases, and I know for a fact that, that they're selling their leases on the basis there's a coral reef down there. It doesn't matter where it is in the in the basin. They do uh, favor an aquifer model, perhaps more so than the uh, geological model. Uh, that follows that pattern a little bit, but uh, I agree. Uh, a lot of and of course, you know, a well core doesn't tell you very much. <laughs> no, but seismic does. Seismic does tell you. Yeah. Um, another question I have is about the, you haven't mentioned the Castile Formation, which is 
which is what, uh, basin word or reef or back? It's right in the middle of that thing, yeah. It's, basin, is, it's the base. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's basin word. What, 100 meters of, of bedded uh, gypsum? 400. 400 meters? Yeah, yeah, it was over 100 meters. But I mean, how do you, how do you, that has to be depositional. That can't be formational. There's, n there's no way to explain gypsum, 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 gypsum by evaporation unless you had some kind of pumping that was very selective. Well, they, they use a reflux model of uh, it. The water came in and got more concentrated further in, precipitated the gypsum, and then, uh, uh, well, the carbonate first and then the gypsum. Uh, and uh, then they do it again. Uh, and they, the brine that is left over, they send back out, and they bring in some fresh for the next layer. <laughs> you go to my web page uh, under uh, field localities for the Castile. I give a diagram of, of their particular model on that thing. But I also show you a peculiar thing there with that Castile. And that is, a, this is one layer that used to be at a road cut, and they've widened the road. I don't know if the layer, where the layer is right now, but that is, uh, we used to stop by and see it, uh, my classes and so on. Uh, it shows you, you have a layer about a foot, a foot of gypsum, okay? And uh, you, you can tell these layers, a thin layer has a thin uh, layer of uh, carbonate on top and so on. Uh, this one has the carbonate on top, which, and it's thicker because it belongs to the cycle. And this is, you don't get this by evaporation. In my, in my chemistry book, you're going to uh, see water you're going to evaporate the carbonate first. It comes down first. You remember that those figures I showed you there? You derive one one half the volume. You, you get uh, nothing. Then this half to one fifth. You get uh, carbonate, and then fifth to uh, about one tenth. You get gypsum. Your carbonate comes out first. Here the carbonate's on top. That stuff's been transported. Uh, and it's got some bad, uh, I wouldn't say it was a turbidite, but uh, it's obviously been, that's not a normal evaporation process for that Castile. I have one question. Um, you, uh, there was somebody who was mentioning that Part of uh, what was happening with reefs, it sounded like modern reefs, but maybe you can correct me on that, was that blocks were coming out uh, during low water episodes. Yeah. Um, and the blocks were meters to kilometers. Yeah. That means that chunks a mile or at least a half a mile big are falling off of these things. Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, I can't give you in a present example of that, but uh, it's semi-plausible uh, that, you know, our, our, our fossil reef, well, look at the reef here, it's, it's, it's not dropping blocks, you, you see that, you look all over, in Europe, these reefs, they're there, they're not falling apart. So I'm, I'm not sure sure about that part of his interpretation. I am glad that he is challenging this Talus story because boy, it sure looked all my life. I've looked at it. And said, Come on, this doesn't fit. And finally, somebody <laughs> said something about it. Well, I'm sure we'll have more questions after the second part, so yeah, uh, come on back if you can. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Roth, for yeah, giving us welcome. this talk.
Next week we'll get a little more into some more picky stuff.